Vsauce, Kevin here with 17.3%. And you think you know what that means because numbers are clear and objective. It's 17.3%. But maybe it's been 17.3% for a while because you focused on getting 31.3 over here down to the low 20s instead. Maybe 17.3 is lower than the average of 21.8 but it was 17.4 last year, so you've made virtually no statistical progress in 12 months. Maybe what you're measuring spiked for a few days just last week, so your 17.3 is a 98.85 increase over the 8.7 it was last Monday. Your problem just basically doubled. Maybe your job depends on what these numbers actually mean and how you can influence them in your favor. And maybe a number that makes us look safer actually means we're less safe. 17.3% means policing may be less about protect and serve and more about perverse incentives. The fact that a number can mean everything and nothing suggests that police departments are gamifying crime. You just don't know it. CompStat is short for either Computer Statistics or Comparative Statistics. No one can actually remember. And to understand CompStat, you need to understand the New York City of the 1970s and 80s. New York was an infamous hotbed of crime, including violent crime. So much so that movies like Death Wish, The Warriors, and Taxi Driver expressed the fear of New Yorkers and enthralled everyone else. Serpico detailed the real-life corruption of New York's own police force, and the Son of Sam murders made every single New Yorker realize how vulnerable they really were. By the 1980s, New York City was a pretty scary place. My earliest personal memory of it was my grandma making my cousin remove and hide her jewelry on a visit to the Statue of Liberty. Rudy Giuliani was elected mayor in 1993 to be tough on crime, and he appointed Bill Bratton as chief of police. Bratton had served as chief of the New York City Transit Police, who had begun using a crime tracking system developed by Jack Maple. It was as simple and basic as you can get. They recorded and mapped crimes on the transit system manually because they weren't doing it at all before. New York City's crime statistics were really only collected for the purpose of reporting them to the FBI, and that meant no actionable real-time information, and the only data they did have was a year old. 20 years after we put a man on the moon, there still wasn't a database that recorded the time your Aunt Ethel got her purse snatched walking home from bingo. The solution? was CompStat, which started in 1994 when the department realized there was way too much crime to track manually with pushpins, so they bought a single computer from Radio Shack. CompStat works like this. Every week, New York City's 98 police precincts, service areas, and transit districts report detailed statistics about all their activity crime reports, arrests, summonses, and tickets, as well as updates on ongoing investigations and changes in crime patterns. That information is loaded into a citywide database that generates CompStat reports with specific statistics and their weekly, monthly, and annual changes over time. Like, maybe muggings are up 14% month-to-month in Bayside, Queens, while they're down 8% citywide. Bayside might have a problem. Maybe the week-to-week -week New York City homicide rate is unchanged at 0%. That's bad. But it's down 83.3% compared to 1993. That's good. CompStat is a sensible way to keep track of threats to public safety and inform how best to respond to them. And the data is only the beginning of the CompStat initiative. It's meant to inform effective tactics, rapid deployment of resources, and relentless follow-up. It drives the daily operations of police forces in most major cities, and its proponents tout its homegrown origins, its efficient and accurate community-based implementation, and its innovative and pivotal role in public safety. But its critics say it fuels harassment and ignores the most serious crimes. 
Criminologist George Kelling was hired by New York City in 1985 after writing the book Fixing Broken Windows, which jump-started a simple theory of policing aggressively rein in really low-level, highly visible crimes like jaywalking and vandalism, and you reduce the public perception of disorder, and a drop in real crime will follow. CompStat fit perfectly with the broken windows theory because all of that stuff is easily tracked and quantifiable. The problem is you get more of what you measure. Weekly CompStat meetings resulted in pressure for precincts to bring down numbers. And that incentivizes two things. One, focusing on what can be measured easily and the raw reduction of statistical outputs. Want to play good cop, bad cop? It's time to play good cop, bad cop. Good cop solves a burglary, which has a negligible impact on the CompStat report. Bad Cop issues 20 tickets for jaywalking that reaches a target quota and proves police are doing something. Good Cop deals with open container violations he comes across when they're a clear and public problem. Bad Cop intentionally seeks them out to improve Monday's numbers, then deliberately switches focus to another minor crime after the Comstat meeting told him to. Good cops, patrols, and community relations efforts have kept crime numbers low, but they've plateaued. It's probably the best they'll ever be since crime is never gonna be zero. Bad cop makes as many arrests as he can to drive numbers down by whatever means necessary. Good cop classifies crimes based on the evidence. Bad cop focuses on just the evidence that will classify a crime in the category he needs the right numbers in. Sometimes that means upgrading or downgrading charges. So like whether a perpetrator is charged with sexual abuse in the fourth degree or forcible touching on a Thursday might depend on a number from a meeting on Monday. So between good cop and bad cop, which cop is likely to get promoted? Uh, according to the numbers, Bad Cop's quantitative results make the case he's a more effective policeman. But the good cop is a good cop, and the math makes his public service invisible. Statistical performance matters, and it can create a conflict between good policing and good comp stat. But how well can we even use arrest data to isolate the true causes of crime in a city? What's a normal fluctuation? Did New York City's crime rate go down because of CompStat, or did life just get better overall? CompStat offers a glimpse at patterns of criminal activity neighborhood and citywide, but it also encourages constant pressure to generate great statistics even when it's not really possible. Comstat seemed to work right out of the gate. In a year, murders were down 20% and felonies on public transit were down about 30%. Jack Maple, whose autobiography is titled The Crime Fighter, Putting the Bad Guys Out of Business, died in 2001. Now Los Angeles and New York and Boston and Washington DC are all using forms of CompStat and smaller police forces are too. We've experienced 30 years of CompStat, including both rises and drops in crime, more transparency with policing data, criticism of random stop and frisk policies, and more questions than when the program started. But we've also gamified public safety. We've kind of turned policing into Pokemon. And at this point, it isn't entirely clear whether we're catching real people or catching arbitrary numbers. Gotta catch them all though, right? And as always, thanks for watching.